You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. Having sex toys in a hotel room? Yeah, I've done that. Having condoms and lube in a hotel room, done that too. And condoms and lube in my hotel room correlate highly with sex toys in my hotel room. More studies required, but there may even be a causal relationship here. Asking for extra towels, guilty as charged. And a causal relationship may also exist between the need for extra towels and the presence of condoms, lube, and sex toys in my hotel room. Not letting housekeeping into do up my room. I frequently make my own bed when I'm traveling and don't let housekeeping in because... I'm a grown-up who makes his own bed, and out of force of habit, I make my own bed when I'm in hotel rooms. And luckily for me, when I'm traveling with sex toys, condoms, and lube, and sometimes making my own bed, and consequently may occasionally need extra towels because of the sex toys, condoms, and lube, when I'm doing all those things, I'm not a woman. If I were a woman, and I were staying at a Marriott and using my sex toys at a Marriott and needing extra towels to mop up at the Marriott... A hotel staffer who'd recently undergone mandatory training to spot the signs of sex trafficking might report me to a manager, who might then report me to the police, and I might find myself, shortly thereafter, sitting in my hotel room in handcuffs I didn't bring with me, having to explain myself to authorities. But I'm a man, and Marriott employees are only trained to regard these things as suspicious if the guest they've been encouraged by their bosses to spy on is a woman traveling alone or a woman traveling with another woman. So I'm not going to end up in handcuffs I didn't bring with me to a Marriott. You, on the other hand, if you're a sexually adventurous woman, you might not be so lucky. Marriott's policy, which amounts to treating all women traveling alone as suspected sex workers and treating all sex workers as suspected victims of trafficking, is just one more manifestation of the sex panic we are currently in. A restaurant in New York City, Nello on the Upper East Side, recently banned women from dining alone at the bar like it's the 1890s under the assumption that any woman eating a bowl of overpriced pasta at the bar is clearly a victim of sex trafficking. A dad recently detained after a United flight because he was cuddling his own kid during the flight and attendants thought that that was suspicious and he might be, you guessed it, a sex trafficker. Panic about sex trafficking is why we have FOSTA-SESTA, that's the Senate's Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, SESTA, and the House's Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, FOSTA, which has resulted, the passage of this act, in driving sex workers off the internet and back onto the street, which has made their lives infinitely more dangerous all under the guise of protecting them. Sex trafficking, which all supporters of ethical sex work oppose, is actually up in the wake of FOSTA-SESTA, up more than 170% in San Francisco alone, according to the most recent stats available, because sex workers, having been driven offline, are now more vulnerable to exploitation. This law, which passed with broad bipartisan support because everybody left and right is afraid of sex, led to the end of personals on Craigslist and the end of porn, aka erotic content and communities on Tumblr, and the gay hookup app Scruff recently banned profile photos of guys in jock straps, lest they be sex workers or confused with sex workers or perceived as sex workers. As Violet Blue unpacks in a terrific new piece at Engadget, censorship of sexual content is spreading all over the Internet. Starbucks is filtering its Wi-Fi with a secret porn blacklist. Blue writes, Patreon, Cloudflare, PayPal, Facebook, Instagram, and Square will eject you for getting near a sex business, linking to perceived sex sites, letting the wrong people use your online business. Facebook has banned sexual slang. YouTube bans users for sex ed or LGBTQ content because it might be about sex. Google Drive scans your files and deletes what it believes to be explicit content. Apple just straight up hates sex, Blue writes. And it's getting pretty ridiculous out there. Sex School, a site where they create and promote explicit sex ed videos, and there is a desperate need for explicit sex ed out there in the world, recently posted a photo of a potato on Instagram, and it was taken down. 
flesh filtering algorithms mistook sex school's potato for a thigh, a nutsack. Who knows? I don't know what the algorithm was thinking or what it thought it saw, but thank God it protected us all from sex school's scandalous potato pick. The internet was supposed to be an engine of freedom and liberation, and not just freeing people and liberating people to share pictures of their lunch with us, but freeing and liberating people in all sorts of ways, including freeing us sexually and liberating us from the stigma, shame, and superstition that attaches to sex. And the way it did that was by bringing people together in online communities where they could talk and share about their own sex lives, about their sexual interests, their sexual practices, their sexual insights. They could share tips about sexual safety. That's a lot of what sex workers were doing online. Not just finding clients, but screening clients and sharing information with other sex workers about safety and best practices and warning them about bad and dangerous clients. And Fosta Sesta put an end to that again, making the lives of sex workers even more dangerous than they already were, all under the guise of protecting them. If you are a supporter of sexual freedom and free sexual expression, and I imagine if you're listening to my show that you are, please know that the same people, the same cultural forces that are attempting to extinguish sexual freedom and free sexual expression on the internet have an agenda that involves off the internet sexual freedom and sexual expression. They would like to extinguish free sexual expression, not just online, but IRL in real life as well. And if you value free sexual expression online and off, don't just fume about it. Do something about it. Here is a thing that you can do. It is a thing that I did today. I joined the Free Speech Coalition. It is an organization fighting for sexual freedom online and off. And I'm going to read their vision statement FSC's vision is a world in which the international adult industry, its workers and businesses have equal rights, protections and freedoms under the law and where all people are protected from exploitation and empowered by age appropriate sexual health education. The Free Speech Coalition is out there fighting FOSTA, fighting SESTA and fighting this sex panic. Join me in joining up today. All right, coming up on today's show, sex researcher Dr. Jana is here to talk about the science of squirting, what the hell is in female ejaculate, and really, should we care? She and I really got going, and I persuaded her to stick around and help me answer another question on the Magnum version of the show, which you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. And now, your calls. This episode of The Lovecast is brought to you by the good folks at Squarespace. They make it easy to build a beautiful website, blog, or online store. Head on over to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Support for today's show, support we are very grateful for, comes from stamps.com. With stamps.com, you can access all the amazing services of the post office right from your desk in your own home, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just click print mail and you are done. It could not be easier. And right now, use Savage for this special offer. Includes up to 55 bucks worth of free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Do not wait. Go to stamps.com, and before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Savage. That's stamps.com. Enter S-A-V-A-G-E. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by adamandeve.com. Get 50% off one item and free shipping when you enter the offer code SAVAGE at checkout. Hi, Dan. I'm a pan, cis, female in an open marriage with a woman living on the West Coast. And here's my situation. Uh, I find that generally my attraction to people grows over time as I get to know them. And as a result, most of my sexual encounters occur with friends or acquaintances. So when I started grad school a few years ago, it gave me a whole new pool of potential hookups. Um, although not as large of a pool as I'd like since the class age average is late 20s, meaning a significant proportion of us are in the relationship. I don't generally seek out people who are monogamously partnered. However, on a couple of occasions, I found myself in a situation where I was hanging out with a classmate and friend who I know has a girlfriend, and um, they've made moves on me. In both instances, my only hesitation to the hookup was their relationship status. They know I'm in an open relationship, and I know they do not have a similar arrangement. Now, I'm not looking for a relationship from them, just an occasional fuck, so I don't care if they have a primary partner. That being said, they're friends, so I don't want these guys to suffer the consequences of their significant others discovering their infidelity. Also, being just an empathetic human being, I don't relish the idea of their girlfriend suffering heartache should they discover their partner cheated. 
But in the heat of the moment, those considerations seem pretty damn small, and I only raised the meagerest of objections before jumping in the sack with them. My question is, what is my obligation in these situations? Should I be saying no because they're lying to their significant others by fucking me, or is it totally on them to not have sex outside the relationship boundaries and I can fuck guilt-free? Yeah, you should be saying no, but you're not saying no. It doesn't sound like you've ever said no to one of your monogamously partnered classmates who made the moves on you, who hit on you. Sounds like you've jumped into bed with every single one of them. And you might want a pass or you might want a little gold star because at least you have the decency to feel not terrible about it, but to feel a little bit guilty about it because what might happen if they get caught sleeping with you and then their SOs, their significant others who aren't you, are hurt and you are playing a role in the infliction of that pain if the affair is discovered. And it's easy for me to say, it's easy for other people to say, I'm sure a lot of people out there listening have already muttered this to themselves, that you're being a a shitty, terrible person. You're a party to these multiple infidelities. Uh, It takes two to tango. It takes two to cheat. And the person, the partnered person who's not in a non-monogamous relationship, your partner, your non-monogamous relationship, they bear more responsibility. They're more culpable. But it's not like you bear no responsibility. It's not like you can fuck all these people who are partnered and potentially create all this pain, be a party to the creation of this pain without accepting some responsibility for it, without being responsible for it to a certain extent. And so I'm going to say all that. And I kind of agree with all that. I just said all that. Usually I agree with the shit that comes out of my mouth, you know, check with me five, 10 years later. We'll go back to the tape. Maybe I won't agree with me. I don't always agree with me five, 10 years later. That's called growing and learning. But, you know, I say all that fully aware that sometimes people are cheating with cause. Sometimes people have grounds. As I've often said, sometimes cheating is the least worst option. Sometimes people are trapped in relationships that for multiple reasons, they have kids, their partner's economically dependent on them. Maybe they're economically dependent on their partner. They may find themselves in a circumstance where they're sexually frustrated or sexually ignored or negated. And Cheating helps them to, as I've often said many times, stay married and stay sane. So there are times when we're party to an infidelity that would cause pain to the person who's being cheated on if they found out about it that actually makes it possible for that couple to stay together. And whether the person who's being cheated on would immediately see this or not or ever see it if the infidelity was discovered It was in their own best interests, maybe in that moment, for that period of time, for their partner to seek sex outside the relationship. I've been doing this a long time. I've heard from numerous people where the emotional connection and the sexual connection in their relationship collapsed, and one or the other or both started seeking sex outside the relationship in an underhanded way. They cheated, sometimes one, but literally, in some cases I've heard about, both partners cheated, and other things kept them together. Kids or economic interdependence uh, kept them together during this time when they were really estranged from each other, and then at some point the relationship kicked back into gear. And the sex outside the relationship that in a way made it possible for him to stay in that relationship, the cheating saved the relationship. You know, when cheating leads to the end of a relationship, we all talk about it. We all hear about it. Uh, Cheating always gets the blame. There are complicating, maybe on the margins, maybe this is just a tiny percentage of the infidelities that happen in the world in any given calendar year. But there are examples on the margin, outliers, definitely outliers, where the cheating saved the relationship. And we never hear about that kind of cheating. We rarely hear about it. If you pick up one of my books, you might read a little bit about one of those examples. But otherwise, we don't hear about it. And this isn't to give you a pass or get you off the hook. Yeah, you are doing a shitty thing that you should feel guilty about. Doesn't sound like feeling guilty is going to stop you. But if you want to feel better about it, you could deploy the rationalization I just unspooled for you. I just handed to you that maybe you're, by fucking these people who are partnered, helping to save relationships, or maybe you're getting with people who are doing what they need to do to stay married and stay sane, and they're in a circumstance where they're trapped and cheating at the least worst option. That's usually not the case when people in their 20s, though, I have to say. When people cheat like this in their 20s, it's usually that they're just too cowardly to exit the relationship. So they're going to engineer a kind of explosive exit for themselves. They're going to slam their hands down on the self-destruct button. They cheat in order to get caught, consciously or subconsciously. That's the desired goal. And that's something you might want to take into consideration, caller, because 
if you're fucking people in the early 20s who don't have grounds, they're not doing what they need to do to stay married and stay sane. They're just fucking around because they want out of their relationship and they're cowards and they can't force the words out of their mouth, but they can force their mouths into your garage to blow up their relationship and, and, and end it. That's going to create a lot of drama. That's going to create a whole lot of blowback. And that's going to blow back on you personally. And it's possible, considering that you're fucking all these people in your graduate program, that the blowback could harm you professionally as well. Hi, Dan. I'm a 28-year-old girl from California, and I've been having an ongoing discussion with a girlfriend of mine. She is 100% against uncircumcised penises, so much so that she will reject any guy with an uncircumcised penis. She actually had her last boyfriend have a circumcision at 36 years old. She told him that if he wouldn't get circumcised, that she wouldn't give him blowjobs and she wouldn't marry him. She swore up and down that after he got circumcised, his dick was larger and felt better. I think that it's complete bullshit. But I don't know. I was wondering what your opinion on this is and if maybe you can throw some facts at me so that I can then relate to her or so that I could shut up about it. Call me old fashioned, but I think if someone gets a circumcision, they get their dick cut at age 36 at your insistence, because otherwise you're not going to suck their dick and you're not going to marry them. And so they go and do it. They go and get a circumcision at age 36. You are obligated to suck that dick for the rest of your goddamn life. You are obligated to marry that motherfucker. You are obligated to suck that motherfucker off during the wedding ceremony, in front of your friends and family, in front of the preacher, in front of God. You are obligated to suck that dick and swallow. No spit. Swallow in that circumstance. Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, your friend is wrong. Cutting the foreskin off does not make the dick bigger. Perhaps it appeared bigger. I doubt it, though. What your friend is telling you is probably the lie she told her ex fiance, her ex boyfriend, who got hit the end of his dick cut off so that she would suck him and marry him. And then she didn't do either or stopped doing the former and never did the latter. She probably told him, consolation prize, oh yeah, you got your dick cut, you got circumcised at age 36 in the hopes that I would suck your dick for the rest of my life and marry you, and I'm not going to do that, but here's your consolation prize, here's your lovely parting gift, your dick looks bigger, your dick felt better. Sorry, I think that's bullshit. I think your friend is telling you the lie that she told her heartbroken, mutilated ex on the way out the door. He shouldn't have done it. He shouldn't have believed her when she said those things. You don't have to believe her when she says those things either. Well, an addendum, like a footnote here. If you flipped the genders on this and some man insisted that your friend get a boob job or get her labia trimmed back so she had that clamshell effect, we would all identify him as the monster, as the bad guy in this terrible story and flipping the genders and it's some woman bullying or manipulating a, a dude into getting the end of his dick cut off at age 36 getting circumcised at age 36 she's a monster i wouldn't be friends with a dude who bullied or pressured his girlfriend into getting a boob job so that he would marry her i wouldn't be friends with a woman who did the same sort of thing to a man either are you in a band? That's so cool. What do you play? Awesome. Do you guys have a website I can check out? No? What's the matter with you? You have to have a website. But I have some good news for you. Building a website does not have to be tedious or unpleasant. It can be easy. And with Squarespace, it can actually be fun. Squarespace makes it a breeze to crank out a beautiful, professional-looking website or blog or even an online store. They have templates that were created by world-class designers that you can just drop in and it looks good right away. And they have built-in e-commerce so you can sell stuff. There's nothing to patch or upgrade. And if you need help, they have 24-7 support. You can make it yourself so easily and make it stand out with Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, 
Use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That helps us out here at the Lovecast, so just do it. That's squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code SAVAGE. Hello. I am a very grateful listener. I identify as a 42-year-old heteronormative feminist white male. I have thought about calling since the first time I listened, mainly because I am unfulfilled sexually. I didn't quite know what I would say, but then it happened and I went to Vegas. I had done research before my trip and at one point entertained the idea that if I hit a certain number while gambling, I would consider negotiations with a sex worker. I hit that number early, but I also decided against negotiating sex. I'm very picky. It's illegal and there were numerous other threats to consider. I enjoyed being kind to the workers that approached me and I enjoyed a little for flirtation, but I have this heart that often gets in the way of my sexual appetite and visceral drive. I thought about the potential traumas that led these women into this life. I thought about my own traumas and acceptance of my disappointing sexual history. I continued to gamble. Just after I cashed out, I sat down to play one more round on a slot machine. Then a beautiful young woman joined my side. As before, I enjoyed being kind to her and the flirtation, but she was damn near perfect, and now I had cash, just a little more than what I told myself would be okay to use for negotiating. There was no hesitation in my mind. It was interesting how we broke the ice considering this was going to be illegal. I asked her if she would either like to get married or come up to my room to help me pack. She said she would like some water and thought that I might have some upstairs. I said that indeed I do, and we headed to the elevator. Once we got to my room, the negotiations began. I started with the number I was comfortable with and enough money to let me know if I would want to spend more. I let her know what I wanted and asked her what was not okay. With boundaries set, I then asked her what she would like. With her answer, I complied by making her comfortable on the bed and giving her a bit of a massage. Now, my time was limited, so shortly thereafter, things got more graphic. However, I continued to make her laugh and to be genuinely sweet to her. I also gave her an orgasm, paid to extend my time, and politely stopped and removed my condom when I knew my time was up. Twice. Though I did not come, my ego boost was kind of insane. When setting boundaries, she told me she did not want me to fuck her like a porn star, so I apologized in advance. I also obliged her wishes. I was sweet and gentle, and I was perfectly satisfied. If there had not been the limit of time, I likely would have tried to reach climax with her. It feels good to have a sense of vigor. It feels good to be confident in my sexuality. It feels good to be a kind and sweet person with a rock hard cock. It feels good to have sex. I have a difficult time being single. I'm okay, but I'm unfulfilled. I have many talents, but I might be best at fucking and I do it very rarely. Uh, I wanna have more sex. I've, I've tried a few various ways of putting myself out there, but I have very high standards and get generally disappointed in humanity when it comes to the dating game and the rat race. I can't afford to employ sex workers because it would cost more than I make. (laughs) And I can't become a sex worker for various other reasons. What I am doing is continuing with therapy, and I'm asking for your advice. You do sound like a decent guy, a sweet and thoughtful and considerate guy, and if everything went down... The way you described your interactions with this sex worker who approached you in Las Vegas. Footnote here, this sex worker who approached you at the slot machines in Las Vegas, uh, not legal. Prostitution is not legal in Las Vegas proper, in the city itself. It's legal in Nevada, but you have to leave Las Vegas to legally hire a sex worker. That said, of course, there are plenty of sex workers who make themselves available, who approach men in hotels, at slot machines, as, as you were approached. Again, if everything went down the way you say that it went down, if you're a trustworthy narrator, you're a good and decent and kind and sweet guy. And it sounds like a lovely interaction. I think what the sex worker said to you about not wanting to be fucked like a porn star is something that not just sex workers should say to a lot of inexperienced or younger guys. It's something that all women and girls might want to say to inexperienced or younger guys who may have watched a lot of pornography and arrive at partnered sex whether they're paying for it or they're getting it for free with pornified expectations and just putting that out there. I want to fuck you. I want to be fucked. I don't want to be fucked. Like you have seen probably thousands and thousands of women being fucked in porn. That's a different kind of athletic 
varsity level fucking or performed aggression slash fucking that I'm not interested in. And I think that was wise and smart of her to say that. And of course, you were the kind of guy who could hear that and respond. And so I want to heap praise on you for this entire episode. Again, if it went down as you described, it would be interesting if we could subpoena and to debrief, interview, question the sex worker as well to verify your story. There's something that you said, though, that I think you might want to talk about with the therapist. There's something that you said, though, that made me think, oh, yeah, this is why he doesn't get laid very often. This may be why he should see sex workers, perhaps exclusively, or see sex workers when he wants to feel that fulfillment you felt when you were sweet and kind and rock hard and good at fucking. You say, I put myself out there, but I have really high standards or I have very high standards. And when I hear a straight guy who's having a hard time dating, have a hard time getting laid or a gay guy say that same thing. A gay guy's having a hard time dating, a hard time getting laid. Often what they're saying is I want someone who is way the fuck out of my league objectively. Beauty standard wise, I don't match the beauty ideal for my particular category, but I can only respond physically. I'm only attracted to, I'm helpless in the face of being only attracted to people who being judged by the same objective beauty standards are way the fuck out of my league. Now, there are definitely people out there who are with partners who are outside of their stultifying, culturally reinforced, sometimes bullshit beauty standard leagues. They're rare. There's often some other imbalance in one of those relationships that compensates, sometimes literally compensates. Hey, how you doing? First lady Melania Trump sometimes figuratively compensates that maybe there's such a strong emotional connection or that person brings something to the table emotionally or socially that the other person who's objectively out of their league, beauty standard wise, really needs and really responds to an actual uh, affection grows there as opposed to, you know, whatever the fuck is going on in the private quarters at the White House, which I don't think anyone would mistake for actual fucking affection. So if you want somebody who's way out of your league, you're going to have to work harder and wait longer and hope that somebody will come along, some woman will come along who's way out of your league, but who sees something in you that she needs, that she likes, that she responds to. And it's not going to be financial. You're not a billionaire or a millionaire. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be social. It's going to be something else. But if you can't learn to find women in other leagues, including your own attractive, the odds are longer. You're making your own odds longer. It may never happen for you or it may happen for you, but it may take a long fucking time to find it. And in the interim, you might want to schedule a few more trips to Las Vegas. Free stuff is the best, but free stuff that will ignite your Valentine's Day is even better. When you go to adamandeve.com and select almost any one item, you will get it at 50% off. That's amazing by itself, but here's where they load on the free stuff. When you enter my exclusive code at checkout, Savage, not only do you get 50% off that one item, you also get 10 tantalizing free items. First, for your viewing pleasure, six free movies. Next, a free mystery pack that includes an item for men, a special toy for women, and something for anyone, plus free shipping. Now, that's a lot of free Valentine's Day stuff. So head on over to adamandeve.com and be sure to use offer code SAVAGE. Again, that's S-A-V-A-G-E, SAVAGE, for 50% off nearly any item and a whole pile of free Valentine's Day stuff. That's SAVAGE at adamandeve.com. Hi, Dan and the Tech Savvy at Risk Youth. I'm a 24-year-old gray ace person, and I have a question about a uh, disclosure about STI status. I have, I've been recently dating somebody for about three months now. We have not had sex, and I have no plan on it either due to me being gray ace, at least not right now. But I currently have a positive status of HPV genital warts. Do I have any obligation to tell him if I have no intent on having sex with this person yet? And I wouldn't have sex with him anyway until I know this is totally cleared up. What should I do here, Dan? Thank you. So you're asexual, but you're gray asexual. And you're not, potentially not, never going to want to, there's your triple negative, have sex with this person. You may want to have sex with this person at some point. A gray asexual exists on the spectrum between asexuality and sexuality. People who are who describe themselves or identify as 
gray ace, aren't interested in sex very often, but sometimes and with some specific person in some specific circumstance, they may wish to be sexual. And if you have a sexually transmitted infection, I think you do need to disclose that. Do you need to disclose it now? Well, have you disclosed your asexuality or your gray asexuality to this person? Do they know that? I think you should disclose that if you're dating and you're putting yourself out there because you'd like an emotional relationship and a lot of people who are asexual date and would like emotional relationships. Other people's realistic expectations when someone approaches them or, or is receptive to them when they want to date is that that person is interested also in sex. So there's your first round of disclosures is that you're asexual. If you've disclosed that already and they have no expectation that you're going to be sexual anytime soon or anytime ever potentially, well then you're not under as great an obligation to disclose as you would be otherwise. Important caveat, are you cuddling? Are you grinding a little bit? Do you enjoy that intimacy of, of physical contact? Even if you aren't interested in sex and a lot of people are asexual, want physical intimacy. They want touch but they don't want sex. And depending on the degree of touch and the degree of disrobing that happens before you touch, the genital warts are relevant because HPV can be spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact. So if you're engaged in a lot of aggressive cuddling, if you are pressing your junk together, not for sexual reasons, but for intimacy and comfort, then you are obligated to disclose your genital warts and disclose them now well in advance of having sex. If indeed, again, you ever have sex with this person. Postage rates have gone up again. Thankfully, stamps.com can ease the pain with big discounts off post office retail rates. With stamps.com, you save five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. That kind of savings really adds up, especially for small businesses. Plus, stamps.com is completely online, which saves you time. No more inconvenient trips to the post office. You just go where your computer and your printer is, and you can take care of it at home, at work, by yourself. Stamps.com automatically calculates and prints the exact amount of postage you need for every letter or package you send. You'll never overpay or put too little postage on a package and have to send it again, again. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail, again, using your own computer and your own printer. They'll even send you a free digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage. Stamps.com will even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs, and they give you postage discounts you can't get at the post office, including five cents off every first class stamp. Anything you can do at the post office, you can now do from your desk at home for less. Right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. See for yourself why over 700,000 small businesses use Stamps.com. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Savage. That's Stamps.com. Click the mic, enter Savage. You'll be doing yourself a favor when you use Stamps.com. You'll be doing us a favor in supporting the Lovecast when you enter the promo code SAVAGE. Stamps.com, enter Savage. We are going to take a quick break from your calls to ask some questions ourselves. And it's a question that frequently comes up. It is a subject that I've gotten a lot of calls about over the year. And it is a subject of some controversy and some dispute and a lot of debate. Joining us by phone, Dr. Jana Vrangalova, a sexuality professor at New York University, an open relationships coach and the co-host of the Science of Sex podcast. Hey, Dr. Jana, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my pleasure. So the subject that I'm teasing there, I was talking about, hinting at, is squirting. Comes up a yes. lot. The question that everybody always has about women who ejaculate, about female ejaculate, is it piss? Yes, is it piss? Well, first of all, as you said, there is still some controversy in the scientific community. The current agreed upon, generally agreed upon answer is that it's yes and no. And... I'm going to break it down. And I would actually, I I've, I've, I've seen that answer before. Yes and no. And I've mm -hmm. wanted to amend that with, and so what? Yes, I agree. That, but that's a separate, yeah, that's a separate issue. Like who, who cares really? Put some <laughs> towels down and, or some wee wee pads or some waterproof sheets. And it's just so much hot it's water. Set. 
<laughs> but exactly. you recently did a, a big uh, AMA, Ask Me Anything, on your Instagram, and everyone should be following you both on Instagram, also on Twitter. You, you post a lot of amazing studies and a lot of great analysis about lots of sexual issues. People should follow you at twitter.com slash Dr. Jana, which is Z-H-A-N-A. But you really went into it uh, on your Instagram about squirting. So yeah. tell us what you know and what everybody out there should know. Okay, so as far as, you know, what is the squirt and where does it come from? As I said, the generally agreed upon currently uh, understanding of what it is, is that there are two different types of ejaculate that can come out of the genital tract of vagina owners. And one of those is kind of a little bit, like small amounts of white milky substance that comes out of the female equivalent of the prostate gland, also known as the skein's glands in, in women. And that has high levels of prostate specific uh, chemicals in it. And so it seems like it's, it's the equivalent of the prostate. Now, that, those glands are tiny and there's not a lot of that type of uh, fluid. So that's not the fluid that people typically think of when they think of squirting. You know, what you see in porn, that gushing squirt that comes out in buckets. Mm -hmm. That squirt is something that has to pass through the bladder. And it's an odorless, clear liquid that may contain traces of urine, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on when the, the, the person last went to the bathroom, how much they've been hydrating, and so on. But so, so that's the kind of the yes and no piece of, of the answer. So what I always think is interesting about this whole debate is uh, you really have to go back to the uterus. You have to go back to that moment, uh, sex differentiation, when the hormones kick in uh, and it, it takes the fetus and it makes typically, there are exceptions, some people are intersex, it makes a, you know, a male sexed infant out of that fetus or a female sex infant out of that same fetus, depending on what hormone zap comes through, mm -hmm. which means that everything you need to build a dick is present if you're going to build a pussy instead, which is why you have the skein's gland, which is sort of this vestigial prostate gland. And perhaps that would have exactly. become, if during sex differentiation, when the hormones kicked in, would have become the prostate gland in the male. And it, it blows men's minds, many men's minds, not all of them, some men know this, to tell them that their dick is just a giant clit. <laughs> and their but balls, yeah, you're right. and their, is a giant the scrotum clit. is the labia. It's just sewn up. Mm -hmm during this, mm -hmm. the, the, this process. So it, it seems obvious to me, and it's always seemed obvious to me, that, that some women have this capacity, you know, their genitals can do this thing that we associate with male genitals. It's not like freakish. It's just, it's the same stuff. The same basic building blocks build male genitals or female genitals. And some, some women, their prostate may be, their, their skin glands may be more kicked in, more active, and they may have this ejaculatory capacity, not because they're from Mars, not because they're space aliens, but because they're humans. Right, exactly. Now, with the skin glands, it's interesting. Some dissection studies have failed to find what would be the skin glands in many women. So it's thought that maybe something like 50% of women even don't have them because they don't seem to serve a reproductive or evolutionarily important purpose in women. As you said, they're a vestigial organ left because there is a very important function for the prostate in men. And so it's possible that some women don't even have them. And th those women who do have them, they kind of come in different variations. Mm -hmm. Some uh, seem to have their own little duct that lead out of the body sort of on their own. And so they drain into these ducts that come out in tiny little openings uh, on the kind of the next to on both sides of the vaginal opening. But then in other women, they may not have their own ducts. They seem like they drain into the urethra of the woman. And so they'll, whatever they, they create, whatever substance, uh, liquid they create, it will drain into the urethra and come out of the urethra. So it's, it's, it is confusing. I mean, you can't blame people for being confused about this mm -hmm. because there's so much variability in that regard. But I do want to point out that this is different from that gushing squirt 
that most people will associate with squirting. Which is tied to the bladder. And right. what is going on there exactly? You know, when, when you become aroused, when you're sexually aroused, a whole bunch of sort of, uh, you know, blood flows uh, to the genitals and there is this mm-hmm. swelling of the tissues and it's drawing in a lot of fluid to the neighborhood, all sorts of different kinds of fluid. And, you know, my seat of my pants, pull it out of my ass theory is that there's something going on with the bladder where it's just basically sucking in and processing during arousal uh, mm-hmm. as hitting those plateaus when a woman hits her, you know, uh, pre-orgasmic plateaus in arousal. And it's just suddenly the bladder is processing a lot of fluid and pulling it in. And in some women, that all comes flying out. And it's not the same thing as the waste product that is piss, although there may be trace amounts of it. But why can't we get a handle? I, you know, why can't we? We didn't even know what the clit looked like until about 10 minutes ago. We haven't studied exactly. women's genitals, women's arousal patterns, female ejaculate. We haven't studied anything until very recently. Uh, and we focused and centered males for so long. So why don't we know because of that? But what do you think is, is going on there? My theory is just the whole neighborhood is getting busy and the bladder is pulling out of the bloodstream or whatever, all these fluids that aren't the same as waste product. And that's what we're seeing flying out. Yeah, I, I think your your theory is kind of correct. Uh, again, we don't have a lot of evidence to suggest that it is or it isn't. But what we do know from a relatively recent study that actually got a lot of media attention, uh, which did these uh, ultrasounds for uh, on women who are squirters, and they did ultrasounds right before they started um, uh, sexual pleasure in the lab. Uh, it was a it was a fun and funny study to do. But uh, they did ultrasounds on the bladder to see what the state of the bladder was. They had them pee, then they had an ultrasound again, then they had them start uh, sexually stimulate themselves, squirt, did another ultrasound, uh, then <laughs> uh, did a sort of go pee again and so on. And what they found during that process was that obviously before the women peed, before sexual arousal, their bladders were full. Then they went and peed, the bladders were empty. And then they started sexual arousal and right before they squirted, their bladders were full again, like fully full. And And then after they squirted, the bladders were empty. And so they hadn't been like knocking back beers while they were starting to become aroused. Well, they had been drinking water before that as they were kind of preparing for the, for the squirting experience. But it, is, it, it sounds like during arousal, you do have the, the pulling of the water, as you were saying, through the bladder. But it just doesn't, maybe doesn't have enough time to process or uh, uh, to, to become that completely waste product that urine is. Mm-hmm. And it will mix with, you know, whatever is maybe left in the bladder from the previous urination. This is speculative at this point. Well, all of my uh, best theories are speculative and sometimes they are confirmed by science for which I'm eternally grateful for science. Um, (laughs) Quickly, another thing that comes up when we talk about squirting, you know, there's some women out there who want to learn how to squirt. I understand you're doing a workshop for women who want to learn how to squirt. So one of the, the, yeah, it sounds sounds like squirting is really having its moment. It's one of the most common questions I get whenever I talk about almost anything. And a lot of people are interested, both men and and women are interested in getting uh, to learn how to squirt. And I've actually teamed up with another sex educator, Kenneth Play, who is a master of squirting, has had a lot of success with um, a lot of vagina owners and getting them to squirt. And so we've created an online course that people can sort of download and watch on their own. It's a bunch of videos that guide them step-by-step through the process and include some of the science that we, we have at the moment about it. So yeah, that's, that's out there on the internet and people can uh, in, enjoy and learn and educate on their own time. Okay, so those are those, there, there are those people who want to learn how to squirt. I also mm-hmm. hear from people who suddenly started squirting that it wasn't something that they were seeking out and they want to know how to stop. Like they suddenly, they hit some point in their life, everything kind of kicks into gear, I guess, <laughs> without any intent or desire. And they're suddenly mm-hmm. squirting all over the place. They have usually what they describe as one really intense sexual encounter with someone who really paid attention to their junk or their, you know, went searching for that G spot in a way that no one else had. And they squirted and then they can't stop. Every time they have sex now, every time they climax, they squirt. And I've gotten questions, not from people who want to learn how to squirt, but people who want to turn that tap off. Is there any advice for them? Interesting. Yeah. So 
the squirting coming out, the squirting, the ejaculate, the ejaculate coming out is just a physical expulsion of liquid. And, you know, bodies change and how things are exactly positioned change and what you hit or not hit that can change over time. So it's perfectly normal to have some of these changes happen that you were able to squirt and then you're no longer able to squirt and vice versa. And Kenneth Lay often talks about the, the difference between involuntary squirting and voluntary squirting. People can have a level of control over their muscle, the PC muscle, and when to bear down or not bear down. And so even though, you know, if you provide the right kind of, uh, the right kind of stimulation to the G-spot, you can get that liquid out, but also you can slowly develop over time the, the control of how much or when you want to let it out or not let it out. And it's, you know, we know so little about this that it might be possible that for some women, they can't develop that, that muscle control uh, or even with very strong muscle control, sort of the opening just is open and it's difficult to, it would be difficult to close and shut it off. So the, but the advice then for someone who wants to unlearn how to squirt would be to lean into squirting for a while and to really um, educate themselves, maybe watch your, your program, your, your YouTube videos about squirting so that they can really know what's going on and really understand their own body. And maybe the key then would be there that once you really know how to, if they can learn how to, how to control it, when to turn it off and turn it. Yeah, exactly. So lean into squirting for a bit, learn what are the initial signs that you're getting there. How can you maybe delay it a little bit and so on. And hopefully that will create more control. And all of the squirters, kind of the, the uh, voluntary squirters that I've talked to, they have over, very often it started with completely involuntary. It just happened to them one day because something, you know, someone hit something and then over time they learned how to control it. So we mentioned a couple of times that there hasn't been a lot of science in this area. And by, by <laughs> area, in this sense, I mean women, a lot of sex research focused on men. You're trying to address the, the science gap here when it comes to this particular issue. Yeah, there, has, there really has been very little research on this. Uh, when we were creating this program, the online uh, course, I went through all of the research on squirting that has been published in the academic literature. I mean, I, I combed through everything, and there's so, so little. Even the basic questions that I get all the time from, from people, like, can all women squirt? Um, is squirting always an orgasm? Or how often is squirting an orgasm? Is a squirting orgasm better, more intense than a non-squirting orgasm. What are the things that get you to squirt? You know, what kind of specific types of stimulations get you to squirt? How do you feel about squirting? How do your partners feel about squirting? How do you know, partners of vagina owners feel about squirting? All of these things we, we have so little evidence on. And, you know, some anecdotal evidence, and there are a couple of studies, a couple of surveys who have asked people and not even with large samples, so Kenneth and I decided to put together sort of the most detailed survey on squirting ever put together and put it out uh, on the internet and hopefully get the largest sample of people who've ever taken a, sur- a squirting survey so that we can answer some of these questions. So you're looking for participants. Is the survey up and active now? Where can people find it? We just put it out. People can find it at squirtingsurvey.com. Dr. Jana Vrangalova, thank you so much for jumping on the phone. Thank you so much for having me. And everybody out there, you should join me in following Dr. Zana on Twitter. So much great research, so many great insights. Twitter.com, Dr. Zana, and you can find your way to her Instagram and her Facebook and her website via her Twitter. Thank you again, Dr. Zana. Thank you. I persuaded Dr. Zana to stick around and help me answer a question about companionate marriage. You can hear that on the Magnum version of the show, which you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. The Magnum Savage Lovecast, twice as long and no ads. Let's read the tweets. GDH tweets, seems like clitful thinking should be a good parallel to dickful thinking because they're both motivated by something similar. Twatful sounds like thoughtful which is sort of the opposite. Hashtag Savage Lovecast at Fake Dan Savage. You are right, GDH. Dickful thinking is, of course, when your dick gets involved and impacts your wishful thinking and you're doing a little dickful thinking. And in a recent response to a caller who was a woman engaged in a little bit of seemed like dickful thinking, I said twatful thinking, but clitful thinking is, of course, what I should have gone with had it occurred to me. Thank you, GDH, for the suggestion. 
Thomas Carver tweets, as a tremendous fan of cocksucking, let me just say there's nothing wrong with a small dick. In fact, you can do some stuff with a smaller dick that you cannot do with a bigger one. Hashtag Savage Lovecast. Another endorsement for men of all sizes. Amanda tweets, carpool with 13 to 14 year olds, car started, audio synced, auto opened. Hashtag Savage Lovecast. Hearing Dan's voice. Three kids did not react, but one kid's eyes got really big, caught mine, then looked away. Not sure if I got street cred or teen horror, but either way, thanks, Dan Savage. Thank you, Amanda, for listening, and thank you, 13 or 14-year-old in the car with Amanda for also being a listener. And finally, Seth Kaplan tweets, hey, at fake Dan Savage, hashtag Savage Lovecast, that guy joined the army, and he quotes a tweet from a U.S. Army judge who said to a company commander that asked me if he can order a soldier to shave an otherwise regs mustache because it looks like a Hitler mustache and is prejudicial to good order and discipline. The answer is yes. So it looks like the Hitler mustache dude who was dumped by my caller, who I told to dump the Hitler mustache dude, has joined the army apparently, and the army has told the Hitler mustache dude that the Hitler mustache has to go. Hitler lost the war, won the mustache. Please, people. No Hitler mustaches. All right, that was this week's tweets. If you want me to read your tweet on a coming episode of the Savage Lovecast, be sure to use the hashtag Savage Lovecast. And now your response calls. Hey, Dan. I was just calling in regards to episode 640 about the woman who wouldn't send her man nudes over her company phone. You are 100% correct. I worked at a very small company, but their policy, even as small as they were, was that their phones were their property. So they could take them and search them and seize them at any time. And no matter what was on them, no matter what you had done, you could get in trouble for it because it was essentially the company's property. That woman needs to not be sending any sort of, or even doing anything questionable on that phone. If that individual would like to go that route, he needs to buy her his own phone. Hey, Dan, I wanted to call about uh, episode 640 for the lady um, who's concerned about her polyamorous partner dating younger girls. At the risk of sounding naive, I wanted to give the younger girl side of the story. While it's true, 18 to 20, that's my age, your old girls are fetishized. It also is reversed. Um, age play is a real kink and is very hot. And uh, I have a 50-year-old partner and he makes me really happy. <laughs> So it doesn't have to be some creepy thing. Um, I'm actually uh, good friends with his uh, 50-year-old partner as well, and it works. And, you know, maybe in three years I'll find it scary and want to go away from it. But it's had a really positive impact on my life. All my friends are supportive. And I don't know, maybe hear him out before you jump to conclusions. Hi, Dan. This is a comment for the uh, caller that is worried about offending the juicy pussy she's eating. I'm not a lesbian, but I do have a juicy pussy. And I will say um, I find it kind of romantic when my partners leave a little hand towel for me on the bedside table. Nice little bit of hospitality that makes me feel more comfortable about it. Um, But also I've had um, guys when they're eating me out kind of wipe their mouth on the side of my thigh or if we're in a particular place we don't want to dirty laying um, a towel down underneath so they can periodically you know wipe their face or mouth or beard so hope that helps I'm not offended at all by it it makes me feel kind of seen loved and accepted that they they still want to go for it And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. My Dirty Little Film Festival, Hump, is out there on the road, headed to a city near you. This week, Hump is in Palm Springs at the Camelot. For tickets and more info, head over to humpfilmfest.com. I am also going out on the road this year to Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, Seattle, Denver, San Francisco, Chicago, Madison, Minneapolis, Toronto, Canada, Somerville, Massachusetts. Savage Love Live is coming to you. Go to savagelovecast.com and click on events to get tickets. As we've already announced in San Francisco, Stormy Daniels, who is such a big hit when she sat in on an episode of the Savage Love Cast, is joining me live on stage to give sex advice. We will have other guests and other surprises for Savage Love Cast live audiences in other cities, but an SF 
If you're a Stormy Daniels fan, you're going to want to get a ticket right away. If you're a Stormy Daniels fan and you're not an SF, you're going to want to get your ass to SF on Friday, June 7th to see me and Stormy Daniels together at the Palace of Fine Arts Theater. Tickets at SavageLoveCast.com events. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Dr. Jana on Twitter at Dr. Jana, spelled Z-H-A-N-A. And please take her squirting survey at squirtingsurvey.com. Com. The Savage Love Cast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Love Cast. Thanks for downloading.